Hi, I'm Bill Perkins. Welcome to Compass TV. If you love the Lord, love your Bible, and love to learn, you're going to love this presentation. Frank Peretti was the first nonfiction Christian author to achieve national bestseller status. His books like This Present Darkness, Piercing the Darkness, and The Oath, to name a few, sold in the millions. But it was his speaking abilities that made him famous at our Student of Mind Bible conferences through the years. His presentation, The Chair, has been our most requested video of all time. It's been viewed an estimated 100,000 times. The chair was about every person's need for a fixed point of reference outside our lives, separate from us. In this presentation, Frank uses a simple rotten apple to illustrate where our society is headed today. Enjoy The Apple by Frank Peretti. <laughs> well, Glorioski, hi. Boy, it's good to see you. You are the church of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. God's got plans for you. And uh, now, my job today, and I'm really glad for the talks I've heard up to this point, especially the one that came right before me, because now I can take off from there. <laughs> and my job today is, uh, it's not my job to tell you how bad the world is getting. We've already done that. My job is to build on what, what she said. And I, my job is to prepare and equip you to live here while you are here. Whenever you go, that's a whole other matter. I'll let the other people talk about that. My job is to equip you. And I, now, we're going to talk about the apple in a little bit, but uh, you know, Bill and I talked about this, and oh, let's do the apple. And, and I sat down to do the apple, and after I started working on the apple, it started growing, you know, and the talk just kind of got bigger. So the apple's kind of buried in the middle of it there somewhere. But uh, it's better to call this living in Ephesus because that's kind of where we are. We just got through hearing about living in a weird world that's falling and getting weird. So here we go. Now, here's the, uh, uh, the thing to remember. You know this. We actually live two different places, right? We, well, we live in the kingdom, the, the, the surrounding culture that we've already heard about, we already know about, we're all grappling with, we're all wondering, Ooh, what's going to happen next? Well, whatever's going to happen next is going to happen. You can count on that, and it'll be the next thing. But I'll talk about the... I'm just so smart, I come up with these great things. All right, we're also living in the kingdom of God, and that is eternal. And that's one thing I, I really wanted to emphasize, God's plan for the fullness of time. Uh, one thing we have, especially among the younger ones, is just like she was saying, we have no sense of history. When you have no sense of history, you have a very narrow and very short perspective of time. You don't know how long it's taken things. You know, the church has been around for 2,000 years. And God's people in Israel have been around for another 2,000, well, even farther back than that. There's a long, long, long progression of time going on. And God has a plan from before the foundation of the world, clear until the whole consummation of the ages. And it's good to keep that in mind. Keep that as a, as a reference point. Now, let's see here. I can get this thing to work. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. I'm new at this. I used to use Italian overheads, which just meant running around and, and being an idiot a lot. So that um, Christ loves the church. Now, he starts out saying, husbands, love your wives. Pay attention to this part. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. I trust Jesus with his church. Jesus is going to build his church. Just like we saw the scripture, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is going to set apart his church. He's going to make you weird to the world just because you haven't moved. You're still standing on the truth. The more you stand on the truth, the weirder you're going to look, which just kind of shows how upside down things have gotten. You can be a drag queen reading the kids in a public library and that's normal. You can be a mom and a dad raising your kids in a Christian home and that's weird. 
What kind of a world are we living in? We're living in Ephesus. Anyway, the Lord Jesus also says he's going to cleanse his church. He's going to work on it. And that's a whole other talk uh, I'm going to give one of these days. I believe that the Lord is going to sift his church. He's going to work on it. There's a lot of changes. We hear a lot of, well, the church is doing this and the church isn't doing that. Don't worry. He'll take care of it. He'll take care of it. There are a lot of factors coming into that. But tonight, I want to talk about four major. Good. Isn't that beautiful? (laughs) Are you ready? Let's see if this works now. I'm going to try and four big headings for tonight. I want you to be aware of. Boom. Therefore, whore, whore, whore. ultimacy, entropy, and truth. Those are my four big headings. I'm going to talk about how we all live in a world of therefore. If you're a, if you're a, a lover of the Lord and a lover of his word, then you walk and you live and you respond and you make your decisions in a world of Therefore, so let's talk about therefore. There's, I call it a, a therefore pattern. Basically, and it's kind of funny, you see this as Paul's writing his epistles. He writes in Colossians, he writes in Ephesians, he writes in Romans. He basically says, okay, now, here is the basic truth you need to know. You got that? You got that? Okay, therefore, based on that, you walk this way. See, that's how you base your life. So let's see. Let's go into that. Ooh, okay. Here we are. Here's the pattern now. This is in Colossians 1. Now watch this. He says, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be, here it comes, filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's this part. <sighs> So as to (laughs) walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. He does this again in Colossians. Now, with all all respect to the word of God, I'm going to kind of skim over the highlights to make my point. But here it comes. He's writing to the Colossians. He covers all kinds of fantastic things. Our hope is laid up in heaven, and we're delivered from the domain of darkness to light. Uh, the, The nature of Christ, he talks about the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He talks about God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And then he says, say it with me. Therefore, all right, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. I got another one. In Romans, he talks about the gospel as the power of God and the salvation, the wrath of God against all ungodliness. The law shows us to be none to be righteous, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He's laying foundation stones. He's putting stones under your feet of truth and knowledge, and ah, I can build my life on this. It keeps going. He talks about faith as being the faith of Abraham. He goes on. He says, you're free in Christ. There is no condemnation. You're, there's a future glory as sons of God and joint heirs with Christ. He goes through the whole uh, God's plan for Israel and for the Gentiles. And then he says, I appeal to you. Therefore, all right. Brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This is the pattern. I call this the therefore pattern, where uh, Paul especially, he lays down all this foundational stuff to guide you and equip you and establish you. And then once he gives you that, he gives you the therefore. I I got another one. (laughs) Ephesians, God chose us before the foundation of the world in his plan for the fullness of time. 
He wants to unite all things in Christ. He talks about the hope of his calling, the riches of his inheritance, the power of his resurrection. Christ raised from the dead, seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places above all powers and every name that is named. We are saved by grace through faith, and we are his workmanship. And the Jews and the Gentiles are going to become one people in the Spirit to unite all things in Christ. I, therefore... A prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now that's the idea of therefore. The fact that you have a foundation under your feet. And we talked about how the world's lost that. It doesn't have that anymore. That, it's adrift, it's rotting, it's decaying, it's uh, falling into chaos. Don't think that the world out there is going to get away with it. That's the sad part. You see, a lot of these agendas at play right now, do you realize they are writing their own destruction? It's uh, a little ironic, you know. Yeah, there's a coming judgment and so forth, but you know, in a lot of cases, God doesn't have to strike anybody with lightning. All he has to do is leave them to themselves, and they will write their own judgment, their own destruction. Very sad. Well, let's see. Cool. All right. Oh, isn't that lovely scenery? I took this slide. In, oh, no. That's a <laughs> Here we go. Boom, ultimacy. Now, <laughs> okay, because you have the foundation stones under your feet, we've had this referred to a couple other times today. I want to emphasize it again. I use the word ultimacy. Uh, we heard, uh, you know, absolute truth, all of that. So here's my way of talking about it, ultimacy. What does ultimacy mean? Well, it's kind of the answer to the question, well, who says? Why should I? When you take God out of the picture, well, let me look at this here. Okay, the Ten Commandments. I remember uh, talking to a gal. Uh, she was a relative, actually. And... Uh, You've probably heard a line like this, well, I'm not going to impose my religious beliefs on my kids, you know. Uh, I, I want them to be free to, you know, I'm not going to tell them about God or anything. I don't really buy into the God thing. I'm just, uh, they can keep the Ten Commandments, and that's good enough. That just goes to show how much she knows about the Ten Commandments. <laughs> of course, you got the first, is it four or five, that address the existence of God and how we're to revere him and have no other gods before him. You can't take God out of the picture. But the other thing about this is, if God did not give us the Ten Commandments, what are they? Straw, words, opinions, ink on paper. Who says you have to obey them? If there's no authority behind those words, then it's pointless. There's nothing there. That's what I mean by ultimacy. If <laughs> you can't, ugh, you can't tell your kid to take out the garbage without ultimacy. <laughs> Son, take out the garbage. Well, why should I do that? Who says I have to take out the garbage? I have my own truth. <laughs> you live in your universe, I'll live in my universe. Well, son, here's how it works. <laughs> the Lord God entrusted you to me to raise you in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and to help you understand that there is an ultimate truth and there is ultimacy and there is an ultimate chain of command and there is authority in this universe that derives from the moral origin of the universe, which is God himself, who is the author of our moral value system and who is the author and the, the existence of absolute truth. And I am subject to him for how I raise you. And if I don't make you take out the garbage, he's going to hold me accountable for rebelling against him because I'm letting you rebel against me. You can see the kid. <laughs> ultimacy, ultimacy. I think I had another one here. What is it? Oh, yeah. The Bible is the word of God. You hear this a lot. Ah, the Bible's been translated so many times. How can it be accurate? 
It's not a logical statement, really, because the Bible is either the Word of God or it isn't. If it's the Word of God, well, you can pretty much trust God is going to keep it accurate, and we've got all the background for that. If it's not the Word of God, who cares if it's accurate? It doesn't matter if it's accurate. You can believe whatever you want about it. You're not accountable to it. People don't think about things like this. Have you ever argued? <laughs> Have you ever argued? You know, there's a funny thing going on there. Anytime you argue with somebody, you are appealing to ultimacy. Because, folks, if everybody's entitled to their own truth and everybody can see the universe in their own way, how can you possibly argue about anything? If you're arguing, both of you are assuming that there is a truth that is above both of you and applies to both of you, and the other guy isn't getting it. <laughs> when you argue, you are automatically assuming ultimacy, which is, that's what's interesting. Uh, we all know it's there, even when we try to argue against it. There it is. We, try, we, we see, yeah, we assume ultimacy even, even as we try to deny it. Now, <laughs> here's one for you. This is kind of interesting where a person can negate their own statement. You can't say truth is absolute. That's wrong. <laughs> here's somebody arguing against absolute truth, but they have to have absolute truth to argue against the existence of absolute truth. Here comes another gem. It's wrong to impose your morals on others. I'll wait for the delay here as you process that. Uh, if I tell you it's wrong to impose your morals on others, what am I doing? That's right, I'm imposing my morals on you by telling you that something is wrong. Here's another good one. Oh, this is the Ravi Zacharias story. Uh, he was on the radio, and uh, you can hear this you know, on his website or YouTube or whatever. He's on the radio, and they're talking about you know, Christianity and apologetics, and he's talking about the gospel. And this lady calls in, and she says, Oh, I'm just appalled. You Christians always try to impose your narrow-minded, bigoted, right-wing, French fanatic, conservative beliefs on all the rest of us. There's no right. There's no wrong. And, and, and the conversation continued, but I, I was thinking about this, and I said, you know, Somebody should have asked her, well, lady, if there's no right and there's no wrong, what basis do you have for being appalled? <laughs> you can't be appalled unless there's a right and there's a wrong. And based on the right and the wrong, you can say, this is wrong, therefore I'm appalled. <laughs> Let's see, I had a few others here. They may not be here. Let's see. Oh, yeah, here's one. You can do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anybody. I've been told that. Do you see something uh, that slipped through? Well, we can do whatever we want as long as we don't do da 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 There's an appeal to ultimacy up there. There's still a rule that applies. We can all have different values as long as we respect each other. I heard a gal actually give a lecture on that. It was at a values conference. I thought that was interesting watching these different speakers trying to arrive at how do we get universal values so we all get along and we're all good, nice people in the absence of God. Nobody wanted to, you know, bring God into it. I brought God into it because I said, hey, the only way, <laughs> you know, here you go. Well, as long as we respect each other. Who says I have to respect you? What if I don't respect you? You going to make me? Well, Yeah, in the absence of absolute truth, the only thing left is power. Whoever has the most guns, the most protesters, the most whatever, that's what happens. So, okay, now where am I going? Ultimacy, ultimacy, okay, we did that. Oh, 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 there it is. Okay. Ultimacy, ultimacy assumes there is a transcendent moral law. It's a law that's higher than all of us. It applies to all of us. Now, folks, the reason I'm telling you this is these become the foundation stones for your reasoning. 
and you are living in Ephesus and putting up with all this malarkey going on all around you, this is what establishes you and keeps you from getting all swept away. This is my job, is to equip you and prepare you as the body of Christ to stand on the solid word of God and the fact that there is a transcendent moral law. And like Ravi Zacharias points out, if you have a transcendent moral law, well, that kind of uh, pre uh, pre presupposes us that there has to be a transcendent moral law giver. You've heard of the golden rule. I like the whole phrase of this. Jesus said, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. He didn't stop there. The very next phrase is, for this is the law and the prophets. He made the statement, then he gave it ultimacy. But which is interesting, this is Jesus saying this. He is the ultimacy. <laughs> That's why he could say, you have heard it said that, uh, you know, this or that, the other thing, but I say to you. And the people marveled at his che teaching because he taught as one who has authority, not as the scribes and the Pharisees. All right, well, let's see what we got here. Matthew 7, 12, yes. Okay. Now we're going to go do -do 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 to Ephesus. I've been there three times now, I think. And you know how I got there? By compass and Bill Perkins and he took me there on a Bible lands tour so there you are if you want to go there there's there's a plug okay I don't have a book table that I'm selling any books or anything I'll just plug Bill <laughs> all right anyway <laughs> but it was a pagan culture uh, it was pretty well to do boy they just uh, they unearthed this not too long ago big fancy fancy houses with uh, uh, huge baths and, and kitchens and beautiful mosaics in the floor. They were, they were at the top of their game. Uh, here's the big library, uh, you know, what's left of it. This is where the men of the city would go to study the great philosophers. Uh, honey, I'm going to study the great philosophers. Yeah, okay, sweetie, you go. They go, and there's a tunnel going from there across the street to the local brothel. So... <laughs> Yeah, they did a lot of studying. Um, <laughs> we'll let it go with that. All right. Um, okay, yeah. Oh, now this is a model. It's not there anymore. This is the Temple of Diana. Now, this was the big deal in Ephesus. They were guardians of the goddess Diana or, or Artemis. And they had this huge, huge temple, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And it was a super big deal. And uh, here's the silversmiths were making, you might recall, images of the goddess Diana to, uh, they sold. Every home should have one of these. It's kind of interesting, isn't it, how paganism leads to uh, the grotesque. This is, a, this is a god that man created. Um, anyway, a lot can be said about that. <laughs> she says a lot about herself. All right. Pagan temples, pagan shrines, they're all over the city. You got a whole bunch of them, and you might find this interesting. Eh, it doesn't show up as well. It's the wrong time of day. Looks like a black. All right. <laughs> now, if you had your, use your imagination. This is <laughs> in the hillside there. This is the big theater where all the Ephesians crowded in there, and they roared and they chanted for hours, greatest Diana of the Ephesians, greatest Diana of the Ephesians. They're probably saying, Diana, Diana, Diana. Things haven't changed much, have they? <laughs> well, you do not have a therefore. You do not have ultimacy. When you don't have ultimacy, you have a blank screen. <laughs> Boom, entropy. Okay. Let's see. What do I want to say about this? Ah, yes. Okay. Oh, I got to get my apple. <laughs> All right, here's my apple. Now, the thing about an apple is, you can take that apple and put it on the windowsill. And if you leave it on the windowsill, 
long enough, something begins to happen to the apple. It starts turning brown. Then it starts getting kind of gooey. And that just kind of continues to rot and continues to rot. You know, that is entropy. Entropy, I think I've got the definition up here. Let's see if I can get there. Yes, entropy is the natural tendency of things to go from order to disorder. That apple begins to break down. You've uh, all had, a lot of you do composting in your garden. You know a compost pile. You put all the weeds and the clippings and the limbs and all that stuff in there. Then you just turn it once in a while, give it some water, and then you just let it sit there, and it begins to break down and begins to rot. If you have a whole closet, <laughs> you are familiar with entropy. <laughs> Things go from order to disorder. If you have a car or a boat or a, if you have a log home. My apologies to those who own a log home. I owned a log home for 20 years. And I decided, you know what? When you have a log home, all of nature thinks your house is a dead tree. <laughs> the bugs bore into it. The birds nest in it. The sun bleaches it. And so it's a lot of trouble uh, taking care of a log home. But what, what is my point here? The point is <laughs> things have a natural tendency to decay, to break down, to go from order to disorder. Now, Paul was dealing with exactly that. He's talking to a culture. Remember now, he's coming into Ephesus to establish a church. One of the first things he has to work on is, I've got to get these people situated so they're not breaking slowly down in moral entropy. He says right here, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are, look at these words, darkened in their understanding. They're alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous. They've given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Living in Ephesus. One thing I need to tell you, make sure I got this right. Yeah, okay. I'll go ahead and bring it up. Okay, there it is. This is one thing I was talking about having a long term view of things and not a short term view of things. One thing you're going to find in this Ephesian culture of ours is a short term view of things. Uh, especially with the media and the news. And, and you just you have the news coming to you all the time. Bam, bam, bam. And every news story is being replaced by the next one. And you don't have that much time to think in terms of a continual process. And that's one of the big problems, pardon me, with uh, the younger generations. They are living in the now because the now is all they know. You know, when you're 69... You have a longer perspective of things just because you've been around longer. You have a different perspective of, of the church and God's plan for things and the flow of events and the flow of history because you've been there. But our culture today has a very short perspective. Now, that's, that is why they don't realize that entropy, moral entropy, such as the apple or your compost pile or your hall closet. Moral entropy has no stopping point. The apple is never going to get to a place where it stops rotting. The LGBTQ movement is never going to come to a place where it's happy. Hey, good. All right, we've got the rights, we've got the drag queens in the libraries, we've got control of the schools, we've got control of the media, the major corporations are scared to death of us if they don't celebrate us. We've got it. We're happy. Okay, we're fine. We're all equal now and everything. We're good. Okay, we'll leave you alone now. I think I've got it here. Bestiality. Bestiality. Um, pedophilia is the next one. Uh, that's what the ladies are in the libraries for is to get the kids ready. There are young boys now dressing in drag and performing lewdly for men. Um, and you know what the line's going to be? 
oh, we have to let them express themselves and find their own sexuality, and who are we to da 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 well, Anyway, that's a whole other, you, I don't need to fill in all the blanks. But there will always be a next thing. And that, that's the funny thing, funny, as in strange. You, uh, you see the talk shows and things like that, and people are just bending over backwards to accommodate, excuse me, celebrate this thing, and all oh, we're going to have equality and everything, and, and, and it's the Christians who are the bad guys. I just want to emphasize for today, it has no stopping point. It is going somewhere. And the point <laughs> derived from that is, let's say, make sure it's staying in order. Okay, yeah. Every one of us, it doesn't matter if you're Christian or not, every one of us has that particular bar that we place. This is my value system, my moral value system. And, uh, oh, I'm okay with this, and I'm okay with this, and, I, I, you know, I'm fine with that, and, hey, I can celebrate this. Every one of us is going to come to a point where, bam, we can't lower our bar anymore. But you have to bear in mind the surrounding culture is going to keep lowering that bar. So it doesn't matter where you draw the line, you will have to draw the line at some point. Are you okay with gay marriage? Okay. How are you with pedophilia? How are you with bestiality? How are you with, well, we'll get into the details. We hit a milestone on TV the other, oh, quite a while ago. Uh, I've never seen it before. It's kind of fun. You're watching uh, a series on TV, and you're kind of cruising along and enjoying the story and everything, and then suddenly here are two men having anal rectal sex right there in the bed. <laughs> Click. I turned it off, and I said, I can't. You know, the point I'm making is they're pushing it. They're seeing how far they can go, how far they can go. Now, Okay, see, if I go much further, then I'm branded as hateful and all that business. So, okay, but there will be a next thing, and be aware of that, and that is why it, I, <laughs> I think about it. It's like you're the brick in the middle of a compost pile. You get a compost pile, all the brush, and you get a big old concrete block and put it in there. And the, con you know, the compost is going to, after a while, the brick is going to start showing. And that's where we are now. Everything was pretty comfortable, but as long as that brick didn't change, didn't move, didn't lower its bar, it starts sticking up. And the surrounding compost pile starts getting very, very upset with it. Now, let me see if I got that cup. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. Uh, I was reading a book. It's an interesting book. It's called Debating Religious Liberty and Discrimination by these three authors. The last name there, John Corvino, he is arguing uh, against discrimination. The whole debate is, well, does religious freedom, quote unquote, constitute discrimination? Because that's the big argument. Um, uh, we Christians, we're, we're trying to defend our religious freedom, the freedom to, you know, not get involved and celebrate uh, this moral revolution going on. At the same time, the big weapon against us is you're discriminating. You're discriminating, and so forth. Well, part of John Corvino's argument, and this is coming up, uh, this recently became illegal in Switzerland. Um, I think it might be illegal in Canada now. Uh, uh, let's find that out. But it's, you heard it. As a matter of fact, dignitary harm was some of the language used in the Obergefell decision. Uh, we have to codify gay marriage, otherwise we are harming the dignity of people. Now, well, what is that? Okay. Here's the definition that Corvino gave in the book. It is treating people as inferior, regardless of whether anyone recognizes the mistreatment. It is causing people to feel inferior, intentionally or not. It is contributing to, are you ready, systemic moral inequality, intentionally or not. 
Just dwell on that phrase for just a little bit, systemic moral inequality. What does the gospel say? For all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The gospel is about saving sinners. How can you preach the gospel if people are not confronted with their sin? And how dare you preach any kind of a message that says there's something wrong with you? There's something wrong with all of us. We're all sinners. How dare you suggest that there's something wrong with my behavior? Now, this is an interesting insight. I just want to, this is not exhaustive. It doesn't carry, uh, you know, fill the whole gamut. But I was talking to, <coughs> some of you might know Tim Remington and, and Cindy. I don't, he's a local pastor. He's the guy that got shot a little while back. But anyway, he works with uh, drug addicts and he works with a lot of folks involved in the uh, gay, homosexual kind of thing. All that to say, Dignitary harm is a very fancy, legally schmeagly word for shame. It's a fascinating uh, just insight into this. God gave us a conscience. We're made in his image. And our best friend is actually our conscience. And shame is our best friend in terms of are you ever going to get right with God? Are you going to, do you need, to, you need a Savior? Well, you can't feel like you need a Savior unless you know there's something wrong. Shame is something that plagues a whole segment of our society. They don't want to turn away from that which causes the shame. So what they try to do is silence and smear and sue and destroy and disenfranchise and marginalize anything, anyone that ignites that shame. Anything that causes that shame to come to the surface. That, you know, uh, we heard a lot about rage in, in the previous talk. There's a rage. I'm going to go deeper than that. I think a lot of that rage is because of shame. Uh, you've probably dealt with people like this. A lot of counselors have to deal with this. One of the root causes of rage in some people is an awareness that they are basically in the wrong, that they're living in a sinful life. Their protection from that is to rail against anything that speaks shame to them. So it's an interesting thing to uh, keep in mind. Some folks you may be having a whole lot of trouble with right now. It's not that they're mean or nasty or anything else. It's that they are way down deep inside ashamed. They just want to make the noise go away. Don't remind me. Don't give me a cause to feel shame. All right. That's that. So, <coughs> okay. Now we get to truth. Okay. Here's Paul dealing with the Ephesians. Here we are dealing with our living in Ephesus. And here's what Paul says. Remember the therefore? Here's this truth. Here's this truth. Here's the way the Lord set it up. Here's the way the Lord saved you. Here's da, 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 therefore. Okay. Looking around Ephesus and all this, he says, that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, would you please put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness, and holiness. Now here's the first part of Ephesians. Is, all of Ephesians is great, but just to once again skim through this, here's, here's some of the details of the brick, the brick that's in the compost pile. 
You want, you're going to build and equip the church, bringing us to maturity. Don't walk as the Gentiles walk. Put off the old self. Put on the new self. Uh, rules for living, being truthful, angry without sin, not stealing but sharing, no corrupting talk but only talk to build up, be kind and forgiving, be sexually pure. And he gives you the ideal model for the family. He talks about husbands, he talks about wives, he talks about children, he talks about masters and bond servants in our time, management and labor. He talks about putting on the full armor of God. He gives you all this Brick to stand on. Right. I'm a, yeah, there's my brick right there. <laughs> How many have seen Judgment at Nuremberg? That film? Not too many. Oh, you need to see it. It's an older film uh, with uh, Spencer Tracy portraying uh, one of the judges who was called to preside over the Nuremberg trials of these Nazi judges who sent so many innocent people to their deaths during the Nazi regime. And uh, the, the trial goes on, and all of these terrible issues come out, the, the, the persecution, the slaughtering of the Jews, and all, all of that. And all this judgment is going on, and by the end of the trial, uh, Spencer Tracy, as Judge Haywood, is going to render the verdict on these guys. And he says, we've heard lots of things here. We've heard the case. We've heard lots of defense. We've seen things that are so horrible they stagger the imagination. Then he says, a decision must be made in the life of every nation at the very moment when the grasp of the enemy is at its throat. And it seems the only way to survive is to use the means of the enemy to wrest survival from what is expedient. To look the other way. To bend, I'm going to paraphrase a little, to bend. To go along, to be noncommittal, to just follow the descent of the culture no matter how low it goes. It doesn't matter how low the bar goes. It doesn't matter how much you compromise. It doesn't matter how much you celebrate the sin that you see all around you. As long as you just survive. And Judge Haywood comes and makes a very, very interesting point. Survive is what? What is a nation, anyway? It's not a rock. It's not a log. It's not a lifeless object. It's not even that much an extension of yourself. A nation is what it stands for. A nation is what it stands for when standing for something is the most difficult. This is the test of our time. Do we as a people stand on something? Do we have something to stand on? Does our nation have something to stand on? Let me come back here. What can the nation stand for? Once it is cast away, anything to stand on. This is why I want to emphasize to you, folks, remember, please remember, we are living in Ephesus. We are citizens of an eternal kingdom that doesn't change, that doesn't sink, that doesn't compost. You will be called upon to stand on what you know to be true. You will be called upon to stand up for that when standing up for something is the most difficult. I'd like to remind you, living in Ephesus, <laughs> there's the great theater where thousands and thousands of people stood and defied the gospel and hollered, greatest Diana of the Ephesians, greatest Diana of the Ephesians, greatest Diana of the Ephesians. Take a look, people. It's a ruin. Those people are gone. The archaeologists had to unbury that. 
Oh, this wonderful temple of Diana, would you like to see it now? Well, this is where it was. There been all kinds of buildings and farmers and who knows how many people been through. This stuff is just stuck there. Well, and as for those silversmiths that were causing the riots and causing Paul all the trouble because no one was buying their images of Diana anymore, well, they're gone too. I'll tell you who took their place. It's the souvenir hawkers, and you get through going through Ephesus. You have to go through all these crazy little shops, and these guys are there to make sure that you can buy a genuine fake watch. <laughs> Nations and empires and cities rise and fall, and time changes everything. The once great city of Ephesus is now a ruin. But even today, all over the world, in jungles and deserts and farmlands and cities, people of countless languages, yellow, red, black, brown, white, they still read the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians. His voice still echoes across the centuries. For this reason, because I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? What is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, listen to this, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. The plan of the fullness of time. This is the Lord God speaking from before the foundation of the earth clear to the final culmination of all things in the, glor the, the glorious coming of our Lord Jesus. Please do not live here. Live here. This is your kingdom here. This, whatever happens, whenever it happens, is going the way of Ephesus. It is heading for ruin. It will not last. But God's word that you have under your feet, that's going to last. So get into the kingdom and stay there. <laughs> and praise the Lord for the stone beneath our feet that doesn't sink. <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. I pray for your church. I pray, dear Lord, as Paul prayed, that we would be filled with the knowledge of your will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. In these days, Lord, however long they may be before you return, help us to draw that line. Help us to stand on the rock of your word. And we praise and rejoice, dear Lord, that your kingdom is an eternal kingdom. Though all the kingdoms around us turn to rubble, there you stand. And we praise you for that. Bless your church, dear Lord. Sift your church. Strengthen your church. Cleanse it. Purify it. Set it apart. And we thank you for this time together. In Jesus' glorious name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You've been watching The Apple, presented by Frank Peretti. To view more stealing titles, get information on our Holy Land trips, and future Bible conferences, go to compass.org.